Let's keep calm and mother on. Mothering is way too important to do alone and way too serious to be serious all the time. My name is Christy Thomas, and I am here shoulder to shoulder with you, mothering and enjoying life together. This is the podcast where you can focus on being mindful and taking a deep breath with me and learning new things so you can pause and savor the amazing life you already have. Now let's go. Today's guest is Julie Bogart, and she is known for her common sense parenting and education advice. She's the author of the beloved book, The Brave Learner, which has brought joy and freedom to countless parents. Her online coaching community, Brave Learner Home, The Brave Writer Podcast, and Julie's popular Instagram account are lifelines for tens of thousands of weary parents all over the world. Julie's also the creator of the award-winning and innovative online writing program called Brave Writer. She home-educated her five children who are now globe-trotting adults, while Julie lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome, Julie. I am so glad to have you again on Keep Calm and Mother On. Christy, it is always a pleasure. I love it. It is a delight to have you here to talk about your new book that comes out on February 1st, Raising Critical Thinkers. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm excited because this time this book is for all parents and there's homeschooling has certainly informed the work that I've done in it, but it is definitely for all different kinds of parents. You don't have to be a homeschooler to read it. Is it important? Do you think the target audience is then people raising like K through 18 right now? Yeah, or- I do. That's exactly the audience. Now, what's interesting is when I wrote it, I felt like I was addressing two audiences at the same time. There was certainly the parent who's thinking about their child, but then I was also secretly addressing that parent as an individual human being who functions on the planet. Because if you don't have a good grasp of critical thinking for yourself, it's very (laughs) difficult to pass that on to your child. It could just become, you know, manipulation and propaganda, and we certainly don't want that. So I was conscious of wanting to create this really 360 degree view of what it takes to be reflective on your own thinking processes so that when you're working with your kids, you can actually teach them that same skill. I, I absolutely say thank you to this because I think there is no other arena that I've stepped into that has made me change so many views. Oh my gosh, I know. Parenting is the big kahuna, isn't it? You're dealing with all of what I call these free radicals, you know, these little (laughs) human beings that will not submit to your better values and wiser experience. And we are constantly negotiating with them and then also within the peer group of parents. And the parenting space can be really dominated by um, hardcore perspectives and in and out groups and behaviors that we accept and behaviors that we reject. And so we are navigating a whole set of beliefs as adults who are parenting while we're looking at the effects of those choices on children who are having their own perspectives and reactions. Absolutely. To hold the dichotomy that we're still a human and still growing and changing as much as our kids are, even though we're in these older bodies. Right. Is is so hard because we expect (laughs) to be able to change them without needing to change ourselves. I think we assume, I mean, this is true of all humans. Everyone thinks they're a good thinker. It's like everyone thinks they're a good driver, except me. I know I'm not a good driver. I know I'm a bad driver. We just had this conversation in my house. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that might mean you're a critical thinker too, because (laughs) it's very, very hard for people to admit their limits. Uh, People are so well conditioned to the way they see the world and with good reason, all of their experiences, all of their education, their family connections, the place they were raised, how they were raised. These things are invisible to us on a daily basis. And one of the things that's true about this book is originally it was supposed to be called Raising Self-Aware Thinkers. Self-awareness is actually the foundation of critical thinking. We often think of the word critical as meaning, you know, I'm picking apart that other guy's argument, right? I am able to achieve criticism in an effective way. That's what we think it is. It's writing an argumentative essay or research paper. Make sure you use the right font. Yes, it's, it's the... It's the idea that 
I can look at an argument and be critical of it and find its flaws. It works from what Peter Elbow calls the doubting game. We start with, okay, what's wrong with this argument? And we pride ourselves on being able to find it. But what I'm actually arguing for is raising self-aware thinkers. And we could think of the word critical as essential, that we need to be thinking in an essentialist way. We want to know our own thoughts. How did we arrive at this conclusion that is creating such a forceful reaction in me? So when I'm doing research, let's say, into something I believe well, and I stumble across an article that challenges what I thought I knew, Mm -hmm. why am I having this reaction? What is at stake for me? What is preventing me from hearing the argument this person's trying to make? What is it about that argument that will threaten my relationships, my community membership, my sense of identity, my feeling of place in the world. And before we do that work, if we have not done that work, Mm -hmm. we actually cannot achieve critical thinking. All we'll be doing is reinforcing our own perspective. We actually are looking at another person and using what they've expressed to reinforce our place in the world and the way we see things. That's not critical thinking. So critical thinking is unpacking all these relationships with yes. an idea and realizing how they're connected in a big spider web versus right. just saying, like, here are all the ways I'm right all the time and yeah, why so, you're wrong. Right. So I want to take an issue that might be um, one that your audience would really uh, resonate with. So. You know, in America, we have a political right and a political left, and both of them have opinions around child care. So if you look on the progressive side, there's always been a really big, strong lobby to try and get a child care credit for parents, for women who work, because they want them to feel like they can go into the workforce and compete with men and provide for their families. And child care is a big change in the difference between what women need and maybe what men need, need yep. right? This is the way our structure. Yeah, the default is, parenting is, is on motherhood. The, the mother is the one who takes care of kids. <clears throat> so the progressives have been pushing for that for a long time. I've always supported it. I've always thought that was reasonable. Um, on the conservative side, however, I remember hearing the argument made that all mothers who stay home should also get the child care credit. Because they are providing the very service that working mothers are paying for. So if you decided to stay home, why wouldn't we get a child care credit for all those hours that we devoted to child care and did not even earn money? Like at least the woman who's working is getting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. But when I was a stay at home mom, I wasn't getting a paycheck for looking after my children. And for the first, you know, number of years, I was also not even earning a paycheck. And so um, what's fascinating to me, though, is that the two sides can't agree on that. One sees it as a threat (laughs) to the child care idea of the progressives and the conservatives see all these women going into the workplace as undermining the value um, and standing of stay at home mothers. Here we have if we could actually get a 360 degree view and get everyone to express right. how these uh, policy statements actually benefit women in general, children in general, families in general, right. we might be able to achieve consensus. But what we get instead is people plugged into their identities. They yes. immediately feel aligned with conservative or progressive. They are threatened. You know, working moms feel threatened by stay-at-home moms and vice versa. And it becomes like a political football instead of an opportunity for problem solving and critical thinking. Yeah, so there's that's just no way example. to expand your thought there. Right. And right. as you're thinking of it, I'm thinking of it as a military spouse dependent, right? And how it's the normal because of the need of the military that most spouses turn into caregivers initially. That's right. And honestly, I think one of the, one of the underlying questions then is how we see women Mm -hmm. and we want to actually create room to see a variety of lenses of women, just like we have for men. Um, And so one of the problems I think when we're talking about these deeply held beliefs is that we limit the field 
We don't actually expand <laughs> to include a variety of views. Um, one of the exercises I suggest in my book is later in the book, I'm talking about a typical classroom experience. A teacher of a 10th grade social studies class might say, let's have a gun control debate. And yeah. so they'll say, who's pro? And they put them on one side of the room. Who's con? And they put them. So now we've divided the two very different views from each other. They're not talking. They're talking only with people who agree with them. And then we ask them to think of all their arguments. And now they're going to come together and actually argue with each other as though they aren't more invested in winning than they are in listening. Because, of course, they are. They just prepared this argument. They want to be the winner. That does not grow critical thinking. It teaches you how to do what I call, what, what religions call apologetics. Yes. You start with a belief and then you find support for that belief. And then you narrate that support. You don't yes, include you're only on the defense. defense. That's right. You're only sharing what you know proves your side and you're ignoring, excluding anything that doesn't. So that's, that's not healthy. So what I recommend instead is same teacher, same class, same issue. Start by brainstorming a bunch of questions that would be relevant to the gun control issue, like, should we have gun registration? Should we have background checks? Should we um, decide which guns can and can't be purchased by what age person? Uh, where should gun stores be? Like, let's just make a big, long list. What are the regulations around use? What are the regulations around bullets? What are state versus, like, all these issues, mm -hmm. just make a big list. Then divide the class in half not based on their opinions, not pro or con. Right. And and as you would see anyway, once you write that big long list of questions, there is no pro or con because each one of those questions has nuances and further follow-up <laughs> questions. Just more that questions. Could follow, that could fall in any direction. You would also in the classroom want to invite people who have direct experiences with guns yep. to speak up. So you might have a student whose family has generations of hunters you might have a student who lost a sibling in a school shooting. You might have a, a family with a police officer. You might have a family who a member's life was saved by someone using guns to protect them. Yep. These are all very different experiences of guns, and you'd want to distribute these to both groups and make room when they start discussing among themselves for those people, those students, mm -hmm. to actually use their natural vocabulary and their direct experience to make a forceful case for their way of seeing things. We don't exclude them, water them down, argue them out of it. We include them. And then we discuss all the questions, including those experiences we heard, trying to imagine other experiences. We do those in two groups. Yep. And now at the end, we go through and we have each group share some of the meaningful ideas and questions to consider related like, what else would we have to know to answer these questions? And then at the end, here's where they come together. They come together to say, what fresh insight have we generated today? And what is the key issue we need to keep in mind in this discussion? So we go for discussing for the point of driving insight, not mm -hmm. solving the problem or taking a position. When we do that, we do a better job of including all the affected parties, not just the ones who agree with my side. Yes. We avoid calling either side evil, and we actually learn the nuances that create the meaning that help us problem solve. That is the model I wish I saw in school much more. And we can start to facilitate it in our homes because we can actually make space for those dissenting views and actually address them in this meaningful way. Yeah, we can build the bigger table that can fit every every one of those questions and to listen to those lived experiences. Right. And even in your family, like maybe you all agree because parents tend to set the tone for the children. Mm -hmm. It is really important to say things like, you know, this is what we all think about climate control or being a vegan or whatever it is. What do you think people who aren't vegan well, how do you think they would characterize how we eat? Or what do you think about people who disagree with us about climate change? What, what do you think animates them? What's at stake for them? Why do they see it that way? We can invite our kids even to go into the imagination. And they might not have enough experience to even do a very good job. And if you discover that, it's on you to give them <laughs> that experience, that information, those encounters to widen that lens so that they can have a better understanding. 
Yeah, I think pausing and knowing where your kids are and what relationships they have with ideas is how we can make those critical thinkers. Right. So imagination sounds like it's a really powerful tool in critical thinking. It's the key tool. Um, And a lot of times we forget about imagination because we associate it with really early childhood or with we associate, play, my yes, favorite thing. <laughs> yes. With play for sure. And sometimes we associate it with, um, the arts. Yep. So we, we tend to think imagination is for creativity, but we forget that every academic paper you write is a creative act. We forget mm-hmm. that when people are solving mathematical equations or problems, they're using creativity, right? Absolutely. I'm sure you know that your husband's in the military. Yes. How much creativity <laughs> goes into military strategy? A like, lot. A lot. <laughs> and so imagination, the reason imagination is so powerful is it gives us the capacity to be more than ourselves. Yes. When I think of small children who dress up in play clothes, like they put on Robin Hood capes and they steal from the pantry to feed the toddler, mm-hmm. none of us are worried that that child is going to become a robber. Correct. We know that they are just trying to experience what that might feel like to do that act. You know, they, mm-hmm. they crawl on the floor and they eat food from a bowl like a dog. They want to see what that <laughs> feels like. We're not worried that they're becoming dogs. What we need to retain into the academic years is the capacity to almost be like an actor or an actress. You know, when you're in a play, you take on an identity, but no one assumes that that is your new identity. They know you're just playing a part. Yeah. What if we could play the part of a person who loves guns and then play the person who really hates and resents guns and we let ourselves inhabit that vocabulary, feel what it might feel like, get to know the contours of that perspective and create this meaningful partition inside ourselves that allows us to distinguish the identity that's actually ours from the one we're just play acting, experiencing, getting to know for the sake of getting to know it, to generate insight from Mm -hmm. it. We lose that, but you're right. We need to bring it in. We, we discredit play and imagination so much when really it is one of the key aspects of being human. That's right. And part of what I suggest later, um, it, the third section of the book is dedicated to what I call the rhetorical imagination. And so in the same way that we might imagine that this cup is, you know, a a golden jug, you know, (laughs) or that it is, um, we're using it for some kind of magic trick, you know, whatever. Just in the same way we might apply imagination to concrete actions or items and um, dress up clothes and play. In the rhetorical imagination, what we're saying is ideas are toys. Ooh. Ideas values, beliefs are toys. They are Lincoln logs. They are Lego. We get to take them and reorganize them, test them in this one sequence, see what happens if we write from this perspective. I teach this one class and it's called um, advanced composition. It used to teach Mm -hmm. it. um, Now we have teachers who teach it. Uh, And the focus of it is textual criticism. Okay. And so that's a the, pretty big academic word. <laughs> right. So what that means is we're interpreting a text and okay. texts are all kinds of things today. Texts could be this conversation. Texts can be movies, but originally texts were actually writing. And so in this class, the essay that we examine is why I want a wife by Judy Brady, which came mm. out in the inaugural issue of Ms. Magazine in 1971. And it was written by a woman, and it is satire. She's basically saying uh, she ran into an old male friend of hers, and he was getting a divorce, and he's like, but I got to get married again because I need a wife because she's got to do all these (laughs) things for me. And then Judy Brady is like, well, I could use a wife. And so she (laughs) writes this whole very satirical article. When I first present this article to homeschooled students, particularly in the early 2000s, they had a really hard time with it. Because their mothers had all chosen stay-at-home momming and yeah. raising them. And they were feeling immediately defensive. Like, this is a worthy thing. Don't treat it like it's just this servant to a man. My mom is a good person. They couldn't see the rhetoric of it. Why? Because they were living in an era where choosing to stay home was a choice. 
They were not living in an era where the expectation was you stay home. And if you don't, you're a bad human. You're a bad woman. Right. You're not a good wife. And so just the difference between those two eras changed the interpretation of the text. The next step in this rhetorical imaginative space then that I asked them to write Mm -hmm. was to pick an issue they cared about and to write it in satire. So literally putting themselves in the position of a person who would make fun of the thing rather than, you know, in a similar vein. Yeah. And they picked all kinds of stuff. They picked work, they picked video games, but they allowed themselves to imagine a perspective that was the opposite of the one they held and then to write it from that viewpoint. This is what we mean by rhetorical imagination, inhabiting a perspective. It's the allowing it to academic have its dress up. It is academic dress up clothes. Exactly. Exactly. You got it. That's it. In and, and, and when you're playing dress up and trying on these thoughts, you're not trying to be right. You're just practicing walking in those high heel shoes that don't belong to you. Exactly. And the reason that's valuable is because it does have an actual impact on your thinking. So if, for instance, you have a really strong position on a social issue and you try to inhabit that other person, you will discover immediately all your biases, all the reasons (laughs) that you think those other people are horrible. You will get in contact first with your own bias, not with theirs. But that is the beginning. That's the self-awareness. And then you can allow yourself to imagine actually... They have all these controlling factors, too. I wonder what they are for them. So in my world, it's my religion. But for them, they're not religious. Hmm. I wonder why they're not religious. Did they leave a religion or did they just never have one? Uh, If they don't have a religion, on what basis are they forming that view? What resources do they use? Do I value those resources? Why do they value them? Who are the authorities in those resources? Who are they in mine? Why don't they respect mine? Why do I respect theirs? Um, that's the kind of questioning you want to have when you're doing critical thinking. Does this have to be limited to just such big issues or can we bring these into tinier issues that we face like on the regular with our kids? So give me one and I'll do it for you. Um, Or I can pick one. Yeah, let me (laughs) think. I don't know if I can pick one off the top of my head. I mean, right now in my house, right, it's the shift from homeschooling into public schooling. And there's always a, like that shift, but sometimes the opposite way from public school into homeschool. Yeah, I think I, uh, so when you're saying micro, I even went smaller than that. So yeah, imagine okay. you have like a five-year-old yeah, and they've been playing outside all day and it's time for dinner and you ask them to wash their hands. And the oh, five-year-old is yeah. like, <laughs> and the yeah, brushing like, their teeth, flossing, yeah, like all right, those things, all those tiny things. And the five-year-old is like, I hate the way water feels on my hands, so I don't want to wash my hands. And then what do you do? Do you investigate that? No. The average (laughs) parent is like, there are invisible germs that you can't see on your hands that might infect you if you eat finger food using your hands. (laughs) And your child's like... I just sat outside eating potato chips while it was making mud pies and I feel fine. (laughs) Right. And so you are just propagandizing your child with invisible germs and authorities you trust that they've never met. And it becomes a power struggle over absurdity. Mm -hmm. It's a theater of the absurd moment. What if the child comes in, their hands are a little dirty. They've been playing outside. They're like, I don't want to wash my hands. I hate the way water feels on my hands. And you say back to them, wow, tell me more about that. What what happens when water gets on your hands? Well, it's just really cold. Well, have you ever washed with warm water? Oh, well, I wonder. I, I don't know. I don't think that'll feel good either. Well, how about this? I will give you the control over how much water you put on your hand. Show me how much water you can tolerate at what temperature. Let's do an experiment. I've got a thermometer here. Let's measure the temperature of the water and see if you can handle it. Um, and then they're like, no, 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 I just don't like water. Okay, well, what what else do you like on your hands? We have baby wipes. Have you ever used one of those? Do we have hand sanitizer? What would that be like? Should we just do an experiment between water, hand sanitizer, and baby wipes and see which one gets your hands clean? Like, that's critical thinking. Yeah. That's troubleshooting. That's problem solving. And if you want them to understand invisible germs, get the darn microscope and make them visible. Like, oh, well, yeah. why do we do all this propaganda? Your kid probably won't die from having some dirt on their hands while they eat French fries. So quit 
<laughs> overstating <laughs> what isn't true. Actually tell the truth. You might even say, you know what? Yeah, let's roll the dice tonight. Let's eat those French fries <laughs> with dirty hands and see if you get sick. And let's see what it tastes like to eat a fry with dirt on it. Like that's critical thinking at the micro level. That is a really great example. Yeah, let's get out the <laughs> glitter ball and see what happens when someone has germs on their hands and pass it around. Yep. Let's start thinking the way thinking works, not being propagandists for our values and positions and then shaming our children for not jumping on our bandwagon right away, which is what parents do every day of the year. You know, Absolutely. Of course, we want to be right. We're the old ones. We're the ones well, that <laughs> we want to be right. But we also just want to be comfortable. We, we want, want our kids ease. to cooperate so that we don't have to deal with all of this complexity. And I know when your child is pushing on everything, you can't have this conversation over bedtime, hand washing, screen time, eating the vegetables, brushing their teeth. Like I get that. So just yes. pick one, you know, every day or two that you actually investigate more deeply. And if you notice distress, that's the one. Like if it's true distress, like if it's just childishness, like, oh, mom, do I have to brush my teeth? Yep, you do. Um, <laughs> how can I make this easier? I'll stand here and watch you. I'll brush one tooth. You brush the others. Like you can do that. Yeah. But if the child is showing true distress, like I can't believe you won't let me finish my Minecraft build yes. <laughs> or this math program is terrible or I have to binge watch this TV show because all my friends have already seen the episodes and they're going to spoil it for me by telling me the spoilers like they might have a legitimate pain sourced reason and all we do is beat it back with our, you know, parental supervisory perspective. That's not good for the relationship and it's bad for critical thinking. It's, um, I'll, I'll, yeah, you jump in and then I have an well, idea. Yeah. Oh, OK. So <laughs> the other day I was with my son and daughter in law and they have a two year old almost. Well, she is two now, two year old daughter and they all had covid. And um, she had been watching more TV than usual, like Daniel Tiger and <laughs> Lippy yep. and all these absurd things. And so when I got there, they turned off the TV. And then May, the mother, had said to me, you know, Lavender kept asking to watch TV because she would not play. She was just laying on Noah. She had a fever. Aww. And yeah. yeah. And she said, and at first we were like, no, we should be playing. And then we thought, wait a minute. All we want to do is watch TV. We're tired. We're sick. <laughs> And I said, yeah, TV for sickness, those things go together. And she goes, but now that you're here, we'll keep it off. So Lavender, who's two, is listening to this conversation. And so then May says, you know, they, it, Lavender calls me Yaya for yeah. grandma. She calls me Yaya. So she's like, Yaya's here. You guys can play. And then Lavender looks at her mom. She says, no, play with Yaya. Daniel Tiger, you know? And so... <laughs> Like she figured it out quick. Like I am not going to play with Yaya. I'm sick. And you let me watch Daniel Tiger. This is happening at a very young level. And it we is. want to be aware of the way that we have this capricious vision that we just dump on our kids' heads without yes. any context or explanation. And then we, we just have to enforce it. It doesn't actually get across the fence of their own position. They're just now hiding their feelings or throwing a tantrum, neither yeah. of which is optimal. Neither one of those is good. And we just want our kids to be able to have this open relationship with us. We want right. to continue this relationship into their adulthood when we're adults together and we're going to have much different opinions, I'm sure. Well, for sure. And adulthood is its own tricky <laughs> wicket. One of the greatest sources of growth in my life were my teenagers because they brought me perspectives they were encountering that I had not. They got them through social media. They got them from their friends. They got them from school classes. They got them from their own minds. And the first thing a teen does is they look for opinions that are different than their parents. They are just discovering that there is a world out there of rational beings who don't see the world the way the family did. And so they're going to come home and challenge you instantly. I'll never forget arguing with Jacob over a particular social issue that was up for the ballot in my state. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you which yeah. issue it was. And he was like very pro, pro, pro. And he gave me all of his reasons. And he says, what do you think, mom? And I said, well, that's pretty logical the way you argue it. And he goes, so you're going to vote pro? And I said, no, I'm voting con. And he was, <laughs> he burst into tears and he said, mom, I count on you to be logical. And I said, oh. 
I said, I am logical. You didn't ask me the logic for my position. I only was interested in the logic for yours, and it really hangs together well. And I imagine by the time you're my age, your position will be the dominant position. But I have logical reasons for why I see it the way I do, but you didn't ask. So I didn't tell you. He's like, well, they don't make sense. I already showed you the logical view. And I said, well, right. So we can have two different positions yes. that both have internal logic. And it will be interesting for you to look into mine someday if you are interested. So it doesn't mean you're going over to their perspective. <laughs> right. But you are making room for them to actually have a perspective that does not align with yours. And it can coexist within your family. Yeah. They crack yourself open. Yeah. And to really listen. So if if you were raised in an environment that didn't allow <laughs> yourself to listen to other places, right? Oh, yeah. If you were raised in a place where most of us were probably with different issues, maybe not every issues, but how do we go deep? How do we read closely? How do we open up our perspective when, when we're challenged by our kids about different things? I, such a good question. So here's what you do. You always go to the overview effect, the 50,000 degree foot view. You do not start down in the details of their positions. So let's say I remember Jacob. Um, he's my son. He's a lawyer today. He works in the field of human rights. He lives in Bangkok. So he's been interested in political issues for a really long time. And I remember when he was about 14 or 15, he found this video called Zeitgeist, which is really a conspiracy theory cult <laughs> movie. It just goes through like everything about capitalism and the monetary system and the way governments are formed and, you know, the Illuminati, like it really goes yeah. off the deep end. He was riveted to it, thought it was 100% true. And my husband at the time was like, we've got to steer him clear. And I said, no, we don't. This is evidence <laughs> of him growing a mind. For the first time, he's asking, is capitalism the best system for growing a country's uh, revenue? Is our government system actually honoring the democracy principles and the principles of the republic mm -hmm. that I've been told about? Um, is there a secret cobble of people who are pulling all the levers of everything going on in the world? Are the leaders, you know, governed by these other forces that we don't know about? Like, those are fabulous questions to ask. Was I worried he was going to stay there forever? Well, of course not. He's 15. <laughs> what from when I was 15 do I still believe with all my heart and soul? Almost yeah. nothing. Because these are the first introductions. So the way that you hold space is by getting outside the details and into what it's telling you about your child. Oh, my child is fill in the blank, really interested in video gaming because he is actually experiencing himself as powerful. Yep. He is forming relationships with people I don't know. He is using an adult tool that he has freedom and jurisdiction over without my eyes. That's what he's saying when he says, let me play all night. He's not saying, I think video games are great for my brain and you're wrong. He is, <laughs> and those are all the other things informing it. And so then you can engage from that level. Oh, you're having a great time, aren't you? Yeah. You must feel really powerful when you're winning in that game. Show me who your community is. I want to know more about them. What are some of your best tournaments? Show me your leaderboard. Yeah, I, I get it. This why is really this meaningful game? to you. Why this game? Yeah. This is it is the really music, the composer? Yeah. What part right. of it? And and what is what are the skills that you're building? I, I want to know what those are. And once you've kind of done that groundwork where you've started to value the context of why these things are meaningful to them, then you have some room. You can come back and say, well, I would like to trust you with some of my considerations and trust me, some of these might be because I'm old. So you can help me <laughs> That's examine a good them. Disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. You can help me examine them more closely, but here are some of the things I've read. Here are some things I've thought about. Here are the reasons I have this bias. Can we like make meaning from both of these camps, from your camp, from my camp and discuss it more deeply. That's totally different then, well, you want to play. I don't want you to play. I think I'm right. You think you're right. So we'll compromise. That's mm -hmm. not critical thinking. Compromise is saying nobody gets what they want. That's all it means. Yeah. Compromise is uh, awful. 
It's awful. It's like the easy way out, but no one feels good in the relationship when you nope. compromise. Both people feel ripped off in a compromise. Yeah. It's advocated a lot sometimes with different parenting strategies to just compromise and come up with something, but that's not <laughs> seeing the whole human. Part of what we're afraid to do is let things take time. So these conversations that I've had with my kids about politics, social issues, religion are years long now, decades in the making. You do not solve a question like, how much screen time should I have <laughs> in one conversation? This is going to be ongoing. It will change year to year. Your child will have various ideas and feelings about it. Yesterday, I met a parent. I was talking with a parent who had just decided to get rid of all electronics for their 11-year-old son. And at first he said his 11 year old was very upset about it, but that now his son is involved in all these sports and he's figured out other things to play with. And um, he's like, you know, I just, I just have no tolerance for the electronics. And then he made this very interesting comment. <laughs> he said, he's still playing them though when he goes to his friend's house. And he goes, so I think that's enough. So then I thought, well, what he isn't yet anticipating is what this child's mind is forming which is some parents are okay with video games for their kids. Yep. My father is not. I don't understand the difference between those two family dynamics, but because I'm 11, I'll go along with it. Wait yep. till this kid is 14 or 15. All well, different gig. Yeah. Now you have at this secrecy and private versus privacy. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And this parent hasn't successfully helped the child really grasp why this seems like a meaningful discussion or, or choice. Yeah. I would say if you are very worried or you do want your child to take a break, it seems to be dominating everything and you guys have not arrived at any kind of meaningful conclusion that both of you can live with. I don't think there's a problem with putting it on the table and actually taking a break. You could say, you know what? I just feel uncomfortable. I'm the parent. I am sort of making this decision on your behalf. We're going to take a break for a month, but let's check in each week. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do some research. Uh, you know, if it's an eight-year-old, they can't really do research, but but you could do it on both yeah, sides. Like absolutely. both sides, talk with this child and give yourself a little bit of time so that you don't feel pressure because the pressure is what really kills things. You know, conversely, you could just let it them does. game like crazy, and do the same thing. So yep. either of those options is whatever your comfort level will tolerate. <laughs> Absolutely. I think this video game screen time thing, uh, it, it's like beating a dead horse almost right now, because I don't think it's a conversation that's ever going to have an answer. That... It's not going away for one thing. And I did quite a bit of research into video gaming during the creation of this book because uh -huh. I knew it would come up. And the data is just reversing itself right now. <laughs> what they are showing from the longitudinal studies, millions of children globally, millions are playing games. We're not oh, talking yeah. some small group anymore. And there is not a pathological outcome for 99% of them. Like it, the, the pathological outcome is higher for alcohol. And we all tolerate drinking in our culture. <laughs> well, we, I mean, just think about that. There's yeah. drunk driving, there's drunkenness we in do. families, yeah. Al-Anon, AA, all yep. these things exist. We expect, yeah. The vast majority of kids are not ending up in what would be clinically seen yeah. as addiction. Some are. Right. It's there not is that. The, right. But it's not the rate everybody is afraid is occurring. What they are showing is that kids who game are finding meaningful <laughs> self-regulation tools for their yeah. big emotions. Yep. They are using gaming as a way to explore through imagination. Yep. Power structures, lawlessness versus laws, rules versus no rules, what it means to build in community, yes. what it's like to be a part of a system and obeying its constraints, mm -hmm. learning cheat codes, how to get better at beating a system. Like these Absolutely. Are, There's a lot of critical research skills that go into it too. Like a ton. you want to hack the game, you're going to spend hours looking for Wikipedias of different games and YouTube videos and- right. In library and, books, we have a stack of <laughs> library books about a certain game right now. 
that I didn't know existed. (laughs) That's right. And what ends up happening for kids who don't game at all, and that number is a much smaller number today than it was even 10 years ago, is that they actually are um, more dysregulated emotionally, which was a shock to me. They were saying- They were saying in the statistics that kids who game between seven and 10 hours a week are the most emotionally regulated of all the kids. The next is the group that games more than 10 hours. The third is the group that gains less than seven. And the least emotionally healthy were the kids kids who game not at all. So now we don't know if it has to do with the hours some of it could have to do with the, the correlation of the relationships yes, already in the house. Because the kids who are not allowed to game are what dealing else? with a lot of other stresses potentially right. that are making this difficult. So I'm not saying games necessarily totally. create emotional regulation only, but there is a certain factor to it. They were even saying a game like Grand Theft Auto. I, I put this in my book. Grand Theft Auto is all lawless, right? And oh, Totally. Said, <laughs> they said, how great is it that kids can actually experience lawlessness without actually having to create it in reality? Yes. And that Peter Gray and I have talked about this, about oh, how really? basically online is like the sandbox of where there are no adults. So you can do all the things that maybe we used to do while roaming with kids, trying out how to use a lighter right without adults seeing you. Can I start a fire? Yep. Um, all these yeah. things. They're Sh- just shooting can- now. Uh-huh. Running around with cap guns and shooting each <laughs> exactly. other, right? Like that stuff was a part of our lives when yeah. we were kids. I think that part of the reason that video games in particular are so disturbing to parents is that the parent cannot see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Board games, parents love. It's because yep. they're out on a table and you can see what's happening. But video games, you can't see. You're not privy to their thoughts and we hate that. We want to know every little cog <laughs> and every little thought they're having. So I'm not advocating here that you suddenly have, you know, a free for all on screen time. But what I am saying is this is a really great place for parents to explore some of these critical thinking tools Mm -hmm. with their kids because it's destabilizing for the parents mindset as well. It puts you both on a sort of level playing field of not agreeing and having to understand each other better. Well, I appreciate you coming on and having this conversation because through your Brave Writer platform, I learned more about writing and talking about books, the the Brave Brave Learner. Learner, Right. So in the Brave Learner, it was like about homeschooling, but also the other R that you build on was about relationships. And now this one is how to make those relationships stronger when you butt heads, basically. Yeah, I mean, really it is. Um, There are all kinds of tools, though, that will apply to academics. Like I've got exercises for reading, for grammar, for math. There's history, social issues. Uh, Like people are worried. I got an email yesterday asking if this book was going to rate various news shows or denigrate (laughs) the president. And I was like, this book is not a political book. It is literally (laughs) not about that at all. But when we hear the word critical thinking, uh-huh. uh, it skew calls it right now. Yeah. It calls up the, the sort of um, conflict we're experiencing culturally around politics, but yep. that is a reason to read the book, but I promise you, I'm not in there promoting a certain political position or um, a certain party. That's not Excellent. what it's about. Well, thank you. Well, as you're doing all this heavy lifting and promoting raising critical thinking. How are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing for self-care? What's an idea you can share with a mom? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Um, You know, I do workouts on Zoom two or three times a week. So weightlifting and that kind of thing has been just revolutionary now that I'm not running as much. That's felt really, really good. Uh, And then I would say, Watching um, mindless TV is, I, I know that doesn't really sound like self-care, but it really feels like it to me. Like I i can just like sit and do a mindless task and watch Big Bang Theory or something like that. And then the third thing that is the most essential to my mental health is I'm a part of a 12-step group that is for Al-Anon members. And that's where I do sort of my deeper practice. So each morning I have a reading, I spend a few minutes silently just 
People call it meditation. I'm pretty sure it's not meditation what I'm doing. I have yeah. no idea what it is. It's three Breath minutes work. with my, it's not even that. It's more like <laughs> three minutes with my eyes closed waiting for the timer to go off. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, it's a practice in patience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, it's like the, the babyest training wheels ever of what it would look like. Three to, minutes is long. So good job oh for getting gosh, up to three oh, minutes. Right. Thank you. It's I'm sure th- two and a half minutes of thinking about the time and uh, <laughs> That's okay. 30 seconds of breathing. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, for me, it's sort of a mixture of body, mm-hmm. escape, and then mindfulness. It's yeah. those three things that I use. Yeah. Fantastic. So the other thing I end every episode with is a family fun idea. Do you have a, oh. any idea about family fun? Well, in our family, that always means games. So (laughs) we are the board game kings, even card game kings. Noah, my oldest, has a basement with like over 200 board games. That's amazing. We never run out of board game ideas anytime our family's together. We even bring them on vacations with us. So (laughs) I would say for us, board games are the key. And if we're looking for an easy board game recommendation, this is actually more of a card game with a little board. Sushi Go is yes. so much fun, so easy to learn. Oh, we I love, love Sushi game. Go. I am the yeah. Sushi Go master in my house. I, love I put it. a headband on and like <laughs> I have a pregame talk and I have a victory dance. So, yes. Oh, my gosh. I need to see both of those. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. When we go big, we go big here. And I've claimed that it. one as mine. So I've got to rub it in until somebody else dethrones me. So I love it. That's so perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. I hope that people go find your book at the library or go buy it wherever books are sold and find you. Where do you want them to look you up and to follow you in case you're new to them? Yeah. So at Julie Brave Writer is my Instagram handle and I do run that account. And then uh, bravewriter.com is my company and that's where whether you homeschool or not, you will find core There's curriculum or sup- yeah, supplemental um, products that will help you make learning a lot more imaginative. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, finally, RaisingCriticalThinkers.com is the book website, and that's where I'll have book tour information and uh, a free download uh, if you're hosting a book club that will be there for you and all other details, you know, especially media contacts, etc. So thank you very much for that. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being a wonderful, awesome adult and critical thinker. You are welcome. My pleasure, Christy. I love being on your show and I think you're awesome. Thank you. Now, don't forget, you are exactly the right mom for your kids. And I am so thankful that you spent the time listening to this conversation. If you're considering reading Raising Critical Thinkers, reach out to me. I would love to host a small book club. We could do it over Zoom for the listeners of Keep Calm and Mother On. So let me know, but you have to reach out to me. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I am so glad for you. Bye.